common mistakes that you see reptile keepers make with their plants? Are <laughs> yeah, so definitely first one would be like the wrong plant for the wrong environment. Let's say you get like a thrips infestation in your tank and it's like you have almost a thousand dollars worth of plants in there that you don't want to rip out and kill. So what they'll actually do is a CO2 bomb. And so people see that they're like, oh, that'll look good in the tank. But what a lot of people don't realize is those plants like in order for them to thrive, they need a ton of light and they also get way bigger than any tank can actually hold. Welcome to episode number 81 of the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan Perrin. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Make sure you head to animalsathomenetwork.com if you're looking for more information on this episode or any other episode that has been recorded. If you would like early access to the podcast episodes and the opportunity to submit questions to upcoming guests, then make sure you join us at the Patreon community. You can find the links in both the description as well as on the show notes. And thank you very much to Custom Reptile Habitats for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. You can find affiliate links in both the YouTube description or the show notes. And again, if you do make a purchase there, a small commission does come back to me at no extra cost to you. If you want to see the potential of a Custom Reptile Habitats enclosure, I definitely recommend going to check out the Instagram page, Wellspring Herp. That is Wellspring Herpticulture by my friend Roy Arthur Blodgett. He was on the podcast back in episode number in the 20s, I think, maybe 27, something around that. That So if you want to listen to his podcast, you can go check that out there. But also go check out his page because he has two incredible custom reptile habitat enclosures. They're huge and they look awesome. So if you want to see what those look like, definitely go check him out. And let's jump into today's podcast. So speaking of nice, beautiful enclosures, I think one of the best things you can do for your enclosure is adding live plants. But as reptile keepers, most of us are plant murderers and not green thumbs. So we do need some help in this domain. So my guest today is going to help us out with that. That is Nick Mark. You may recognize him from his YouTube channel, Mr. Vivarium. Now, Nick is a professional horticulturalist at a large greenhouse in Ontario, so he really does know a lot about his plants. So in this podcast, we discuss what are some of the top plants that we should be using in both a tropical setup as well as an arid setup. We discuss some of the big mistakes that we make with plants. We discuss good soil and substrate compositions for again for both tropical and arid. How to quarantine your plants and treat pests, which is a really important thing and I sort of learned the hard way why you should be quarantining plants. So we talk about that and we also discuss a Central American biotope that Nick is in the early process of setting up for a couple of dart frog species, which is really fascinating. So this episode has a lot of really good general information when it comes to plants, but I have a feeling we should really have Nick on a couple of times in the future because he has so much information in his head, it's hard to get out in just a single episode. So he's someone that I think I'm going to want to revisit a few conversations with so we can really learn how to make plants thrive in our vivariums. Let's jump into today's episode. Enjoy. Well, Nick, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for doing this. Thanks for having me on. You have a good perspective in the reptile hobby because you are somebody who loves plants. You work with plants professionally as your job. And I think most reptile people have an appreciation for plants, but we often murder them in the process. So I'm hoping yeah. we can get some good tips from you today. So as far as you're concerned, where did your love start with plants or did it start with animals or was it kind of all together? So it, it started with animals, definitely. Like I've enjoyed reptiles, amphibians, pretty much everything uh, since I was a little kid. And like my grandparents had a, had a farm. And so basically it had this giant um, creek that ran into a main river system in their like backwood lot sort of area. So I've been down there like catching crayfish and frogs and fish and everything since I was probably like four-ish, like, yeah. <laughs> As far as back as you can remember, collecting yeah, animals. Pretty yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So where did, and then obviously you started keeping at some point in there. I'm sure reptile keeping came in pretty oh, early. Yeah. Yep. So I think my first reptile, which is kind of sad for a lot of keepers, was a red-eared slider. Oh, yes. Like I came home, or I was home one day, and then my dad's like, surprise, I got you a turtle, and it's in the <laughs> little little critter keeper thing, and it's this like little dot nickel-sized uh red ear that was swimming around i was like oh this is awesome but i'm, sh I'm sure it, it was, had uh, the, the same fate as most red red eared sliders back then uh like i'd say we for the amount of like knowledge we had at the time it lived decently up until it unfortunately died so my parents um like 
they were like, okay, he can't really read. He's only four. So we're going <laughs> to, we're going to kind of look up stuff. So they, they got like a fish tank eventually when it started getting bigger. And then we actually installed like just one of those preformed ponds out in our backyard. And then, so it went out there in the summertime and then it'd be back in its little tiny fish tank in the winter time for the extended winter period that we have. And then unfortunately, because I like, I love this little turtle, I'd always go into the pond and try and grab it and be like, hello, pick it up. And it actually, the one time I put it back in the pond and it got stuck underneath the filter. And then so unfortunately it, uh, it drowned, but oh, yeah, it's yeah. funny. You're the, the second person in, I think two ep- or three episodes who started with red sliders and, and basically the same sort of story. Like they're not a great first pet and they're, they're not really a great pet in the hobby in general because they're just no. huge and, and they require a ton of space and they're, they eat a ton and it's way more work than you think when you buy just a tiny little quarter size gecko oh, or a yeah. turtle. Yeah, it's it's sad too because like when people get these turtles, they get big females will be about a foot, almost a foot and a half long, and it's like most people can't house that properly in them. They just end up dumping them wherever, exactly. and because of how adaptable they are, they're able to like survive. Like I've even found them in one of the local ponds that's around my house, and it's like cool to see them, but it's like it's bad at the same time that you're seeing them too because they push out our native species. Yeah. Yeah. They can be a pretty aggressive invasive species. So then what came next after the turtle? Because when did the plant start coming into the hobby? Because you were saying you started with reptiles. I'm guessing the reptile trade brought you into the plant hobby as well. So tell me about that story. So basically like my grandpa, he was a like cash crop farmer for as long as I could remember. And then my mom, she grew up there, so she's always had a green thumb and there's always been like house plants and a veggie patch and that whole sort of thing. But then I was like, I didn't care about any plants really up until I was about 16 years old. And so my grandparents actually had their, like their 50th anniversary that year. And so we made this insane amount of lemonade. And so my aunt, like as a joke, there was just thousands of these lemon seeds she's like oh i bet you can't grow all those i was like challenge accepted so i looked up how to do it ended up having like 50 little lemon trees in my bedroom for like a year or two until i'm like i don't need all these so i just cut them out that's awesome so that's where the plant story that's where the plant love came in oh yeah definitely because i was like wow i can actually make this thing grow from like this tiny little plant so it didn't actually it didn't come from the hobby. I, I thought I, I was kind of expecting you to say you started to kind of try to build some vivariums or, or whatever, and that sort of sent you down the plant path. So the plants came in totally separately. Oh, yeah. Like my first like reptile that I actually took good care of was a leopard gecko. And like I tried putting plants in there. Like I had a little pot in the tank, that, which was very basic, like tile and then the hide and whatnot and then i had like a little pot in the corner with a cactus in it but mm. at that point it was sort of like my mom was like oh put a cactus in there that'll be cool and i was like okay it's a decoration yeah yeah so as far as your job now you work at a greenhouse so can you tell us a little bit about sort of just the basics day to day i want to get more into what you do on a nitty-gritty basis later but just kind of an overall big picture view. okay yeah so i work at um one of the Ontario's largest like plant distributors. So we are a wholesale and a retail greenhouse. And so basically my day to day is I go in, I make sure everything's alive. I uh, propagate um, according to what we have scheduled for that time of year. And then I will also do integrated pest management. So that will be checking for bugs and treating plants that have bugs and trying to prevent funguses and all that sort of stuff from happening and then as far as your collection goes for now what you're keeping is everything that you have basically live planted maybe you could run through kind of how you've implemented some plants into enclosures okay yeah so at the moment currently i don't have the quote-unquote bioactive (laughs) setups going like I actually hate that word in the <laughs> hobby, but I can touch on that later. Yeah, yeah. Um, but basically right now for what I had were 
last year were a pair of um uh imitator dart frogs so i had the full vivarium and like that was a video i posted on my channel and basically um the way that i did it was i tried to recreate as best i could from the knowledge i could gather like what their habitat is super similar to and so you basically you get the the plants going that would grow in the proper environment so they're high humidity where it's like 80 to 100 percent all the time so having the right plant for the right place and then having the proper lighting i had i still use jungle dawn uh leds from arcadia because they're pretty much the top of the market right now for what you can get for doing that with plants and then i had a mist king system running uh with it pretty good and yeah, it, it was doing super good until like I didn't. It's a very shy species of frog, so I was like, I don't see these. I just see my plants, so I got I got rid of those guys, and then I basically just have that setup. I tore it down and just I'm using it to grow up plants currently. Mm. Okay, awesome. And so, and I, I know you have some interesting projects in the go as well, and I definitely want to come back to the bioactive term because it's it's a funny it's conversation to talk about. But before we do that, can you? lay out some of what you think are maybe some of the better plants for vivarium because like i said reptile keepers tend to just you know gravitate gravitate towards pothos and it's kind of like the golden plant for us and there's definitely better options out there so maybe you could run through a few like we'll, we'll start with some tropical plants okay yeah so like i i see on a bunch of these facebook groups people are like oh look at i just put this vivarium together with these plants and it's like you go and it's the very basic you got your crotons and you got your dracaena and your cordylines and uh te um ficus benjamina which is very popular and those are all like the two three dollar plants you can get that you see at your local walmart or whatever i have and those all are those. like the, <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it's like the the basic easy ones that you can mass produce in a greenhouse and just get them out the door and so people see that they're like, oh, that'll look good in the tank. But what a lot of people don't realize is those plants, like in order for them to thrive, they need a ton of light and they also get way bigger than any tank can actually hold. Mm -hmm. And usually what happens is they don't get enough light and then they die. And then people are all sad because of that. And so like definitely one of the, the top ones that everybody can't, kill or very hard is pothos and yeah. like if you have anything that requires a high humidity environment and you're not good with plants i definitely suggest pothos mm -hmm. and then some other good ones for that um like depending on species whether it's arboreal or not i found that the spider plant there is like three varieties i i don't like variegated stuff so i generally stick with the straight green and it's very grassy looking so it's good for replicating that sort of environment and that's like one of the few i'd recommend for say a blue tongue skink because it grows extremely fast and it's uh really hard to kill mm. yeah but, yeah those are it's it's so funny because it's almost like a meme starter pack you know those starter pack memes where it's oh know, yeah they, they, and that's kind of what it is like you, know, you have the ficus you have the the pothos and the croton in there in there as well and you're right i think those are just the cheap plants that we all buy and inevitably either they die or you have to cut their heads off because they start growing into the screen what about yeah. as far as bromeliads go is there any of your favorite species or there's just kind of any bromeliad works well so for bromeliads like definitely one of my favorite plants out there um they're great in the fact that they come in pretty much every size mm -hmm. so there are people that like their job is to breed different types of brahms and so i really find that the um the uh, neurogelia is probably one of the best that you can use but you'll more often find that the um gusneriads and varizia are a lot more readily available just because they're the ones that have the big showy uh, flower bracts on them so that's what people like but the other ones have a way larger variety of color but you gotta look a little bit harder to find them mm, that makes sense 
Is there any good plants that kind of would give you a larger sort of wood structure? Something I know the reason that people probably gravitate towards something like a ficus is because it branches well and it gives you some good opportunities to climb. Is there any good ones that we don't really use in the hobby that could be used to kind of simulate that same sort of thing that aren't going to pop to the top of the screen? Yeah, I, like that's the thing because most people with your arboreal lizards and so like, for example, like a frilled dragon or whatever, they spend a lot of time uh, horizontally on the trees and it's it's kind of unfortunate that we can't find a plant like that, but everything that is tree-like is going to grow massive and straight up. Mm-hmm. But I found that, or I'm going to be trying out an experiment with a ficus aria. So that's a strangler fig. Oh, cool. Those are like the ones you see on like all the Mayan ruins that are like engulfing it and stuff like that. And what I'm actually going to do to try and get a, like a tree type effect in the cage without actually having a sort of tree structure without growing through it is mount a um, strangler that I'm currently growing out on a few pieces of wood that will just be vertical. Mm. And then basically their habit is to constrict whatever they're growing around and then branch out from that. So you can potentially imitate what an actual tree would look like. Wow, that is really cool. So I, I totally agree. It's it's almost better to create the wood structure, like create wood stalks or, or trunks just by using wood like from outside and then add plants to it to gri- give that tree effect. But th- that sounds really cool, the, the strangler fig, because in, in the rainforest, you see those all over the place and they're amazing to look at. And it's, it's I mean, sometimes they'll even eventually kill the tree on the inside and they're just left with this like hollow lattice structure and they look yeah. incredible. I didn't even know you could buy i've never seen one of those in a greenhouse did do you guys have them I, in your place or no um I <laughs> just by the way it. you answered that it looks like it was stressful to get <laughs> it, yeah it was uh i think i'm probably one of the only people in canada i might be wrong there might be some other crazy plant nerds up in the toronto area that i've managed to acquire some but i was able to get a cutting about a year ago from one and then I rooted it out and now it's currently about two feet tall and then I'm going to be doing more cuttings off of that to make more plants. Have you done any like video or pictures of that or is that still kind of a secret project that you haven't revealed? Yeah, it's kind of a secret project. I haven't really mentioned it yet on um, my channel. Like I haven't really actually uploaded a whole lot to my channel this year just because um, recently my internet cable with like the weather or whatever is kind of sketchy so it'll take a long time to upload video and it's like i was just going to starbucks with my laptop and then doing it there and then <laughs> driving back home but once i get my internet back i'll be pumping out a bunch more videos cool yeah i would love to see that i'll probably get you to send me a photo of it after because i'm really i'll keep it secret but i, I want to see that because that sounds really <laughs> cool yeah. as, as far as um what about arid plants? And is it mainly succulents, or is there any other recommendations in there for like a leopard gecko so, or bearded dragon? So uh, I have to look up the name, but I think it's uh, there is a genus of it's not technically a grass, but it's a grass-like plant from Australia, and I think it's called like Corex or can't remember the Latin off the top of my head, but it's very similar to your. Um, like your sedges and things like that. And they actually grow out in the outback where it's very arid and it's a very, it's a very tough species, but currently there's hardly any in Canada. I actually like imported some seeds from Australia to start growing because I used to have a bearded dragon that I was going to go and do a full naturalistic setup with and have that in there. But he died about 10 months ago. And then, so now I'm just planning on regrowing the seeds because my collection will be substantially larger than it is right now, probably about in a year's time. And I want to do a bunch of arid setups and as many as I can do in a naturalistic sense, I will. So yeah, that would be amazing because that's kind of a hole in the, I, I mean, and, and I, we're going to touch on that bioactive word right away because some people create the tropical environments and it's not that good. It just, you know, they have a few live plants and, and, but then on the arid side, there's not a lot of bioactivity going on or, or, you know, naturalistic enclosures because it is tougher. So that would be really cool. 
as far as grasses go, are there any other, because that was a question I wanted to ask you, are there any other grasses that could be used? Because I was talking to someone the other day that has grass in an enclosure. I forget what it is, but it looks, it like just sounds like it'd be really cool. Are there any that would work in either tropical or arid? Yeah. So for grasses, there's actually a decent amount that will work. Like up in the Toronto Zoo, actually, they have in their uh, tree kangaroo exhibit a ton of I believe it's a variety of sedge grass, I believe. And basically it's, it's a common grass used for landscapes and just turf down in Florida. And they just have, they basically bought a bunch of seed for it and then spread it around their enclosure and it grows up like two, three feet tall. And then the kangaroos will munch on it occasionally and keep it pressed down. So that would work really good. And like more of a tropical setup, let's say you have like a, some species of tortoise or you're, working with a lizard that comes from a more grassy environment but a lot of the grasses that you could buy for like up north don't really fare too well just because mm. they sort of burn out at a certain point because they have to have a dormancy right but, yeah you can't just yeah. take like scott's grass seed and throw it into a tropical it'll just die no yeah like i've tried it before just like for fun or whatever and then usually within I'd say five months, it will just die back, whether it be from it being too high of a humidity without airflow and then it molds or your inhabitant eats it or steps on it too much. It's too bad because I, I know in Canada, we have really nice grass, like the natural grass that grows here. I know yeah. people always talk about it. You go down, like you said, in, in Florida, the grass, like, I don't know if the sedge grass is which mostly is what you see in Florida, but it's totally different than the grass we have here. We have such soft, oh, yeah. nice grass that you can lay on it. It doesn't poke you or anything. No. Yeah. It's like the stuff down there is like adapted for intense sun, harsh environment. So it's very, very calloused over with the leaves. So they don't lose much moisture where up here, it's like we have lighter sun. So it's not as harsh. And yeah. And what about carnivorous plants? Cause I know, I think you've worked with a few of those and that's always something that's intrigued me. Yeah. Carnivorous are definitely one of my passions. I, Currently have probably like four varieties of tropical sundew seeds that I'm waiting to start growing. And then outside, I actually have a bog where I grow Saracenia and yeah. So Saracenia purpurea currently, as well as um, Drosera intermedia, which is a fairly, um, fairly dispersed sundew that can be found throughout most of North America and to Cuba, I believe, as well as Drusera filiformis, which is a very long, stretchy one. Mm. But so, it's actually really cool that a lot of the carnivorous plants that people think of, so like the Venus flytraps, they're not actually a tropical species. Mm -hmm. So they they can actually survive up here in Canada, provided that they're not going to get um, essentially negative 20 and they're fine. But... So do you keep those, do you have any of those outside and, and they, they come back? As I know, they do go into a dormancy period and so they actually work in, in Ontario? Oh yeah. So you can, in Ontario, we're lucky as long as you're in like below Thunder Bay area, you can pretty much grow all of the classic um, carnivorous plants outside. Now you can't grow Nepenthes. They're very, very cold sensitive. So those would have to be done inside a greenhouse or like certain terrariums they work very well in are well. those like your those are your pitchers right pitcher plants yeah those are your pitcher plants that you see on all like the nature documentaries and whatnot so how do you have a bog set up outside well, tell me about that so basically through facebook and facebook groups i discovered a guy named carl mazer now me and him are pretty decent friends we we chat back and forth and he's been into carnivorous plants for probably I forget what he said but I think it's like at least 15 years he's been doing them outside. And so he lives out in Niagara Falls. He has beautiful, like about half his backyard is just filled up with these bogs, filled with Saracenias, and they're filled up with sundews. He's got bladder warts out there. And he's got a whole bed just dedicated to Venus flytraps and swamp orchids. It's insane. Oh, cool. Wow. So how do you set up a bog? Like what... Oh, it's so easy. Basically, as long as you have 
you can use like a preformed pond. And as long as you do like a mix, say, of 50% sand and 50% peat moss, and then you have drainage holes that are like at the very top of it so that water can overflow if it gets too high, then they'll do just fine. Oh, cool. That is really interesting. So as far as for, for coniferous plants into into vivariums, which ones do you think work the best? I mean, I guess pitcher plants, like you said, will work well, but are there, or do the sundews work in tropical vivariums as well? Yeah, so they'll work fine. It's just most of our vivarium inhabitants are relatively clumsy and don't care about the plant. So mm -hmm, true. the sundews are more of a delicate uh, carnivorous true. plant and will usually get trampled pretty bad. Mm. But the penthes generally work fairly good. The only concern I would have about using a pitcher plant in a vivarium is that it might, depending on the size of your inhabitant, might actually eat it. <laughs> right. If you have some small dart frogs or small geckos or something, they can yeah and i've seen like things as like um the size of mice get eaten by a pitcher plant no problem so it's like wow. you have to be very picky with what species you use the one that i would recommend that would be safe for dart frogs or other tropical inhabitants would definitely be nepenthes ampullaria because that one is actually um, evolved not to uh, actually catch insects, but rather it just picks up organic matter such as fallen leaf litter and whatnot, and will break that down instead. So it doesn't have the enzymes to actually break down like flesh and whatnot. Oh, that's interesting. So would you actually have to still feed that plant, like just chuck some old leaves in there? Yeah, occasionally, like if you're adding leaf litter to your enclosure anyway, if you stuck like a leaf or two into one of the pitchers then it would do fine that's awesome as far as common mistakes that you see reptile keepers make with their plants are there some key ones that jump out that just make you frustrated <laughs> yeah so definitely first one would be like the wrong plant for the wrong environment so you'll see a lot of people will put in say a very highlight plant like your cordyline they they need very intense sunlight to keep all their leaves and keep them happy. And if you're just using, let's say a UVB like fluorescent light, it may not be enough. Then you'll just find that all the leaves fall off or people are using like a basking light as the only light source in the tank. So it's like, it's not enough for the plant to actually survive. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's a classic that's where you have just your UV tube and you're wondering why are all the plants dying, but you're really, a UV tube is offering almost no light for the plant. No. <laughs> yeah, it's like you got a low light plant, but nothing can live with hardly anything. So that's, that's like one of the major issues I've seen with plants is that they're not giving it enough light. Now it can somewhat be a tricky situation if you're trying to do a species that's very nocturnal or um, crepuscular and you need very bright lights, but you don't want to stress the animal out. Mm -hmm. So, but you can all also almost do a contrary, like flip with it where you have the tank so filled with plants that it will get enough hide that it feels not stressed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I actually have the same sort of thing with the carpet python that I have. I have really bright lights, and but it's a tall enclosure, and there's lots of plants. So at the bottom, it's pretty much dark, and uh, he's fine. Although he, he does seem to bask under the lights anyway, so it doesn't really make a difference. What about substrates and sort of soils? What do you use for for that? Okay, so for soil, like one of the things in school that I loved the most was actual soil sciences. And basically... For most of your tropical environments, like you'll hear um, people say the word ABG a lot yeah. when they're doing their mixes. And like a lot of people don't know what it means. And it's just a, it was originally a mix made up by the Atlanta Botanical Garden to keep certain species of gooseneriads happy, which are most of the time a very tropical species that need good drainage but they also want to keep the humidity up and not have stagnant soil right and that's basically just a mix of tree fern fiber and peat moss as well as 
Uh, you got sphagnum moss in there, and you also have um, uh, charcoal. And that basically keeps the mix very, very airy, and it can hold a decent amount of moisture without going stagnant because you get the airflow that goes between it. And now for me, I usually do a variation of that to some degree and I'll mix in, like I'm trying to get away from using peat moss just because it's not a very renewable resource. Right. And I'm substituting a lot of the time with uh, cocoa core. Hmm. And so usually a mix of coconut core and I'm starting to really get into using uh, worm castings, which is very beneficial just because of the amount of nutrients that's um, already broken down that's available for plant use as well. It also contains like loads and loads of beneficial bacteria that actually help break down soils and are very, very good for plant growth. And so you use the, use worm castings, coconut core. I always put in charcoal in my mixes just so that any, um, waste that isn't actually broken down by the cleanup crew gets absorbed into it because charcoal has an insane um, surface area. So it actually acts as to, at a certain point, it will basically be a slow release fertilizer. Right. It must be a dream working at a greenhouse. Then you have access to all these different products that are easy at your fingertips. Yeah. Like it's pretty good. I, I do enjoy like messing around the plants especially because we've been getting all the new trendy stuff that's coming out and it's like i get to see it a lot sooner than other people before it becomes a trend it's like oh i i picked that one up for only a dollar and now it's selling for like a hundred or whatever yeah it's crazy how expensive some of those plants get and what about arid soil have you messed around obviously you were talking about maybe doing some naturalistic arid environments and that's something that you want to do in the future so what are you kind of tossing around in your mind for that yeah so with arid mixes um i definitely like look at what environment i'm trying to do because if you if you're trying to replicate an arid environment let's say in australia in the outback that um that composition of soil is very different from say Arizona, or you go down into uh, the deserts that are in um, Venezuela, but you can sort of like, you can actually look up data showing what the soil compositions are. And so when I was planning on doing a bearded dragon setup, I actually contacted the beardy vet out in Australia. He's, um, really good guy to talk to. He basically, he showed, um, the soil composition of the outback because he kept on getting people saying sand is very bad for bearded dragons and all this stuff will get impacted. And he did a soil test and it came back like 97%, uh, quartz sand with like 2% clay. And then it was also, um, uh, like, one percent or a quarter of a percent of something of actually the um uh uh, what's it called iron oxide so like rust which gives it that red coloration and so what i was planning on doing to somewhat replicate it because i wanted to grow plants and everything in it i decided that i was going to use about 70 percent like play sand because that is it's very cheap first of all and it also is pretty similar to uh it's just like quartz sand so it's very clean and then i would be mixing in about 20 percent of that would be worm castings and then 10 percent i was going to use either zoo uh, zoomed's excavator or the new um exoterra uh I can't remember desert sand or something like that, where it's basically right. just straight clay. Yeah, that's interesting. It's funny how the whole impaction thing, and and it's so true how cheap play sand is. You can get like a giant bag for like eight dollars. It's like heavier than you can carry. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah, and then you get charged like fifty bucks for not even a ten pound bag at PetSmart. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I want to touch on one more plant related thing, and then I want to get into some of the projects that you have on the go. 
quarantining plants is something that I discovered is something that you should do. I discovered the hard way. So last summer I bought some umbrella plants like the Shafilla arbicola for my, my carpet python. And then I started noticing the growing tips kept dying. I'm like, what the hell? Like every, they start, you know, they'd come up, you start to see the leaves show up and then they turn black and die. And then, and the leaves were producing a lot of sap as well. And then I look, took a closer look and I realized that it was, had those little brown scaly bugs. They don't even look like bugs. They're just like little yeah. bumps on the leaves. So I was like, oh my gosh. This, so I treated the plant. I took the animal out. I get, kind of did like a, a was isopropyl and some hydrogen peroxide and like trying to kill it. Mm-hmm. And it actually worked well. The plant, it, it killed them off and the plants came back and started throwing out shoots again. But then in a few weeks later, they were popping back up. The shoot tip started dying again. And it was like an everyday thing where I was like going in there with a Q-tip trying to pull them off. And it was a nightmare. And then I eventually just got fed up and just basically pruned them down to just the stalks. And I thought they were going to die, but they did actually come back. And I haven't seen any, like the leaves have come back and there's no yep. sign of pests now. So thankfully, but that was a really annoying experience. So I, I do have a quarantine set up on the other side of my room now where I have some new plants that I'll add in there. So anyway, that's a long story of telling everybody that quarantining is, is something you should do. So maybe we can oh, talk a little bit about that because there are some annoying pests that you can bring in. Yeah, there's there's a lot of annoying bugs. So I find that, or at least I try to with all of my new plants that I bring in, I try to do a quarantine of at least a month before using them in an actual setup. And so what I'll actually do is, like a very good practice is to get rid of all of your soil that is comes in with the plant, repot it, wash off all of its roots because a lot of these bugs will actually lay their eggs and they'll just drop into the dirt. So you think you've killed them off after spraying them with whatever. And then like three weeks later, you've got the same problem and you're like, I thought I just dealed with that. So that's like definitely one of the best things you can do is repot it and then let it sit for about a month outside of any other plants you have that are clean. Another thing that you can also do is like just washing it off. And if you're comfortable, I would recommend doing like a 10% bleach dip on your plant. And no, that will actually just kill off any of the bugs that um, are on there because they can't handle it. That's actually a practice that we do at the nursery with like reusing our pots. We'll soak them for about an hour don't soak your plant for an hour. It would, it wouldn't do very good, but doing a, doing a light bleach dip on the plant for maybe like a minute or two should kill off any bugs that are living on it. So is that the leaves and the roots? No, I wouldn't do the roots just because they're more sensitive to soaking things up, but basically up to your root line, I would just get like a five gallon bucket, mix up water and some bleach and then give it a dip. And it usually works very well. Are there any other insect, because the other thing I did, so once I started this quarantine thing, I have like a a Tupperware container or like a big Rubbermaid tub and I have my new plants in there and I was looking online and I found like homemade DIY insecticidal soap. You just like do like the Dawn and some oil. I think I use castor oil and water and I sprayed it on there. I'm like, this is great. And then like the leaves just burnt up, like so (laughs) many leaves died and they're starting to recover now. And I didn't even see pests on them. I was like, oh, this would be like a prophylactic treatment for anything. And especially my palms, they've just like leaves gone brown and black. So I, I clearly went a little heavy on the insecticide. <laughs> so that's not recommended. But is there any other soaps and things like that that are, are good to bring in when you're doing a quarantine? Yeah. So basically with oils and stuff like that, they work, but it has to be very, very like calculated the amount that you use just because when you add an oil to it, it's going to cut off all the oxygen that is being exchanged in the plant leaf. So you're basically (laughs) suffocating it, but you're also like, it suffocates the bug too. So that's what you're trying to get because then the bug can't breathe and then they die. But usually if you do like dish soap and water, that's going to do most of your super easy insects to kill. So like your aphids and possibly thrips, but I find that there's two commercially available products. So like, you got your safer company and then they make a a product called safer soap, which is basically um, pre-formulated. It's the right amount of soap mixed with water and it's like their own sort of blend. 
And then you also have another product called Endol. And now this actually has a product in there called pyrethrin. And that basically acts as a, um, a neural inhibitor for the bug. So it basically puts them into a spasm and then they die. Mm. And they are both relatively safe as long as you just wash your plant after uh, doing this before you introduce it with your animals. Is there any product that you could use in a situation where the animals, their plants are already in the vivarium? Like, could you, I guess, theoretically, the dawn and water shouldn't be toxic for the animal because dawn is not, is, is, I mean, you don't want to use a ton, but if you use a light spray, would that be okay? Do you think, I mean, I'm not asking for a vet opinion here, but I'm just wondering. Yeah. So I would like, as long as the animals taken out of the enclosure, I think that the dawn sort of method would work. I've also heard, um, a lot of people in the dark frog community, uh, they will actually, let's say you get like a thrips infestation in your tank and it's like, you have almost a thousand dollars worth of plants in there that you don't want to rip out and kill. So what they'll actually do is a CO2 bomb Mm -hmm. where they'll basically funnel in either using like CO2 canister or they'll get dry ice and they basically close up everything except for a tube that goes into the tank. And then they'll have the CO2 pumping in there for however long, maybe a day or two until it runs out. And then basically the plants will take in the CO2 and then turn that into oxygen, but the bugs will suffocate because they have no oxygen to breathe at the current time. And obviously the do- the frogs are pulled out before they do that. Yeah. Yeah. They, t- they, they, they do <laughs> the frogs out. That one. Yeah. Be good. <laughs> I actually, I think I have those thrips things on my, on a hibiscus because it seems like those things come in on hibiscus plants all the time and they're like those oh, little yeah. or I don't know if those are thrips they're like these little tiny black kind of they're like long shaped little bugs yeah that's most likely thrips you'll yeah. get like the two most common are western flower thrip which are yellow and they they really like pollen so they'll hang out around flowers and then you get your greenhouse thrip which are the black ones that are very just because of how the greenhouse industry has been the last 20 years, a lot of the greenhouse thrips have actually developed immunity to a lot of the commercial pesticides, which mm-hmm. makes them really hard to kill, which is unfortunate for people that are just bringing it in and don't have access to harsh chemicals. Yeah, it's and, and I guess in the end of the day, something like a like I don't I'm not really bothered by them as much. They're in my day gecko enclosure. They're not affecting her. They're not actually really damaging the plant. The plant still grows and blooms and everything. So I, I do wish I didn't have them. But at the end of the day, it's not like a, a snake mites situation where it's like going to harm the yeah. animal. But it definitely quarantining plants is for sure something that should be practiced across the board. Yeah. Like if you have plants in your house, even if you just have house plants, it's, it's a very good practice to get into. Yeah. I learned that the hard way. So <laughs> as far as your personal collection goes, let's, let's talk about that a little bit because you said you have some interesting projects on the go. So I know one for sure is the Central American bio biotope. So maybe we'll start with talking about that. And then I want to talk to you about the, uh, actually, before we do that, let's talk about the bioactive thing. And then we'll, we'll okay. get into some of the other setups that you want. So tell me why you're annoyed by the term bioactive. So if you look into like, I've been in the dart frog hobby, like dealing with the plants and that sort of thing, the longest for the quote unquote bioactive. And it annoys a lot of like the, when I was in newbie, I basically like hopped on to denture board and all these other things. And people have been keeping plants in vivariums and frogs for probably 20 years now. And it's always just been called the naturalistic vivarium. And like, in a sense, the word vivarium means self-contained ecosystem. So it's kind of a redundant thing. And then yeah. it's like, oh, it's a bioactive vivarium. What's bioactive? Oh, it's got it's a self-contained ecosystem. Well, that's what vivarium means. So yeah, it's a vivarium vivarium. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure the word bioactive is like some skincare beauty products or whatever. Cause I've seen that a lot when I've gone on Instagram, mm-hmm. I've just like hit the hashtag and then you see all these like Korean or whatever beauty products pop up. I'm just like, Oh <laughs> yeah. It, it's definitely a buzzword. And it's funny. Cause I, I never really realized how, annoying it is until i talked to troy goldberg and because he's obviously a dart a dart frog hobbyist and and they do say it in sort of this tongue-in-cheek kind of way and 
it, it, that just show, highlights how far behind the reptile hobby is from the amphibian hobby. And it's really frustrating that we have this side of the hobby. Th- these two hobbies are so closely linked. And we have a side yeah. of the hobby that really focuses on the vivarium and the, you know, how beautiful they are growing plants and all this. Mm-hmm. And then you have the reptile people who, you know, throw in, I always say like throw in seven isopods and they think that they've hit gold <laughs> yeah. standard care. And it's like, well, these guys have been doing it literally since the eighties and we're still trying to get off of like tubs and paper towel. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So let's talk about that Central American biotype. So tell me about the inspiration for doing it, and then we'll talk about what it is exactly. Okay, so last year, or no, 2019, it it sounds weird since we've been in quarantine for so long, but Mm -hmm. 2019, myself and my friend uh, Mike Titula, who I'm sure a lot of your viewers know already, uh, we basically never met before we've always we've just been chatting on instagram it's like hey it'd be a fun idea to go herping down in costa rica and so one thing led to another we end up going to costa rica and then we went to the costa rican amphibian research center and it's like beautiful pristine rainforest it's like old growth and then in the past 20 something years that he's owned the property he's converted farm pasture into a new growth rainforest And so basically I was like in awe of how beautiful it was. It's like, this is amazing. There's dart frogs that are literally hopping across the porch. Like this is awesome. And so my favorite species of dart frog is Ufaga pamilio. So the little strawberry poison dart frogs that you see on all the nature documentaries. Yeah. And I was like, I want to recreate that. Like that was the original intent for my first, um, youtube vivarium but then i had the opportunity from a friend who was getting out of the hobby that's how i got the imitators but that was like okay i'm stuck in quarantine what can i do for fun and so i was like i miss costa rica i'm gonna recreate that Mm -hmm. yeah that's awesome and it is an amazing country and mike kind of told his side of that story as well when he was on the podcast and he he said the same thing like i just met up with someone that i have not met before and that was you you're the counterpart to that story so it is amazing how influential being in the rainforest can be for the keeper it's almost impossible to leave a rainforest and then not at least attempt a little bit to replicate that if you're keeping you know a central american species yeah it's like literally one of the most beautiful places i've ever been so i'm just like i love canada and i love like our ecosystems they're like uncomparable to everything else but it's like there's just so much biodiversity there that literally if you look in a 10 foot span there's more plant species in that one patch than there is in like 20 kilometers of ontario yeah, exactly. And I think that's one of the claim to, claims to fame with Costa Rica is that it actually is one of the most biodiverse places on the planet when you're talking about yeah. like not, not ju- even more biodiverse than the Amazon, which seems pretty incredible. So what is your plan to, to create this biotype? So basically, I've been collecting, I think, since um, pretty much like that summer, like not intentionally, but I'd see a cool plant, I'd buy it and I'd this past year with the quarantine, I'm like, I want to do a biotope because it's very popular in the aquascaping community with fish. And there they have access to a lot of plants that are native to where the fish are actually native, but it's not so much the same, like when you get into dart frogs and like the reptile hobby in general. So I basically was like, okay, I have this plant, this plant, this plant, this plant. They're all actually native to Central America, I'm going to do a biotope of that. So then I started seeking out different plants. So I have like three species of Peperomia. I also have um, Anthurium. That one's a hybrid though. And then I've got a few others that I can't remember off the top of my head, but they're in that range from basically Guatemala down into uh, Panama. And right now you have them all growing in a, are they just growing in that original viv that you had set up for the imitator frogs? Yeah. Or? So I've got like one, one or two begonias that are in there. And then I also have like in that little tank in the corner, I'm growing yeah. out yeah. Some more uh, stuff right there. And so what is your plan for the scape of it? Or, or maybe you start with the actual dimensions of the enclosure and then we can talk about the scape. 
So uh, the <laughs> dimensions, it's the big tank. So it's uh, 24, 18, 36. And basically my plan for it is the two, and I'm going to be breaking a big rule in the dart frog hobby and keeping two species in there. So I'll be keeping Ufaga pamilio as well as uh, Dendrobates uh, erratus, which are both native to Costa Rica. And the only reason I'm actually going to be mixing them in the same enclosures because of how large it is. When we were at the research center, I literally saw an Ufaga hop onto a uh, Aratus like under a log. So I'm just like, they have enough room to get away from each other. So it's not, it's not going to be a big issue. What is the issue with cohabbing frogs? Are they aggressive to each other? Like, can they damage each other? It seems like they're so, they're so small. Yeah, so frogs can um, be aggressive towards each other, especially when it comes to, like, whether it's the same species and you have one sex that outnumbers the other just for breeding and territorial stuff. But as long as the... Um, the frogs are actually in two different uh, niches almost. So erratus generally stick to the ground level. Like they'll be around rotten logs and forest floor where you'll get ufaga that will basically be on the sort of like the base of trees that goes all the way up. They'll climb an insane amount to the bromeliads, which are probably like 30 feet up into a tree. And then they usually, they're slightly more arboreal. So so you'll be able to set it up in a way that they should occupy those two niches and, and very rarely cross each other's yeah. paths. And I'm going to be keeping it like very low stocked because I'm only going to keep a pair of Ufaga and uh, hopefully a trio of Aratus okay. in the tank. Will you use any water features or anything? Or I'm, I'm sure you have a misting system, but is there anything else that you plan on doing? Yeah, so I'm planning on possibly doing a small stream in there not sure i haven't decided too much but there probably will be a small pond of some some sort just because erratus out of the dart frogs are the most aquatic that it would seem hmm. but they they can't swim i don't suggest doing anything deeper than say an inch or two right yeah that makes sense and then as far as the soil, I know that's one thing you we talked about in DMs, you were talking about replicating that soil. And my experience in Costa Rica is the soil has this like very orangey red color. And I remember falling in the rainforest on my ass and those shorts are still the color of that soil. Like it never came out. So yeah. it's, it's like a very powdery, just it's like a dye almost. So are you trying to replicate that as well or? Yeah, so the soil composition of like, Costa Rica, especially around like the rainforest area, it's very unique in the fact that it's basically straight clay. Like you'll get so many feet of clay. And then just because of how fast the organism organisms in the forest floor break down organic matter, it doesn't really like have a chance to build up enough. And then with all the rainfall, it usually gets washed into the river systems. So it's basically all the stuff is growing on clay. And then about a foot or two of leaf litter itself. So will you just basically use that kind of Zoomed or, or Zilla or whatever that was, that uh, exoteric clay or whatever, and just stack that up and then use lots of leaf litter? Or how's your plan there? So what I've basically been thinking is I'm going to do a sort of mix of, you can get those big blocks of like red art clay from like craft stores and whatnot. And... I'm going to, like my first vivarium I ever built was a cat litter clay background. And so I'm going to be kind of replicating that where I'll be mixing in red art clay and then the cheaper cat litter just to get that sort of um, texture. And then the actual substrate itself will be sort of my original um, tropical mix that I did a video on. And then I'll be adding more bits of clay. So I'll actually be rolling up clay into balls and then mixing it into the substrate itself. Oh, wow. That sounds amazing. I will definitely look forward to that. And and then you have some other projects you were talking about. You said that within a year from now, you'll probably have a larger, you know, more to the collection. So how, why, what, what's kind of driving you to do that, grow the collection to, and then do those extra projects? And then what are those extra projects? 
Okay, so basically, I'm going to be uh, in the next year, I'm going to be launching a new business that I have officially, which will be a uh, wildlife educational business. So I'll be doing like public presentation shows, birthday parties, and like bringing reptiles out into the public eye, essentially. And so I'm going to be using a bunch of ambassador animals, but I'm going to try my best to do as many cages as like feasibly possible in a naturalistic sense. Oh, that's awesome. That, uh, that would be, and hopefully by the time you're doing that, we're rolling out of COVID and yeah, that can, things can go back to normal. Yeah. So what, what are the other projects you, you mentioned maybe an arid setup? So what are some other animals that you're hoping to set up? So I'm looking currently like into right now I have a redfoot tortoise. I have a pair of cane toads. I'm currently waiting to pick up my tegu and I have a bunch of invertebrates. And so hopefully I'll be able to do a few, like a small shelf for my inverts of doing naturalistic setups for them. So I've got the um, curly haired tarantula, which are native to Central America. So I'm just basically going to do a little copy and paste of the big biotope for that one. And then I've got a green bottle blue, which are native to the desert and um, Venezuela. So I'm going to be trying to do, trying to do a arid setup with that one as best as I can. Now they are a very web happy species. So I'm sure finding the right plant for that will be a little challenging, but we'll, we'll see what we can do with that. Oh, interesting. That's cool. And then is your plan to document some of that and put that on the YouTube channel? Oh yeah, definitely. So we're also going to be hopefully doing, um, a new YouTube channel as well, where we'll be, when I'm not doing um, live shows and whatnot, I'm going to be getting up close and personal with wildlife that's uh, not so hands-on for the average person. We'll be showing off uh, like our ambassador animals on that channel as well. But I'll also, I'll probably, until I get um, the business up and running, I'll be showing every all the builds and whatnot on my main Mr. Vivarium channel for now. When you say not handleable for the average person. What sort of animals are we talking about here? Uh, like wolves, big cats, bison, oh, crocodilians, cool. like that sort of thing. And will, like that will be in a zoo setting, or uh, a little, a little of both. Now, like because of the whole travel restrictions in Canada, I've sort of been um, cataloging different places that I'm able to go to and. and basically shoot like wildlife shows that will be for YouTube similar to like inspired by like the crocodile hunter and different stuff like that. Oh, cool. Well, I know that. Yeah. In your, in your Instagram bio, it says aspiring filmmaker. So I imagine that's where this is going to take you. Yeah. Do you have a name for that channel yet or is it still in the works? So I registered our company name last, you know, two weeks ago now, and it's going to be called Expedition Wildside. Okay, cool. Well, I'll make sure that eventually when that is up and, and running, I'll, I'll come back and add it into the show notes of this episode. So if anyone's listening to this in the future, maybe by the time that's set up, you can find that there. Is there anything that we haven't covered today that you wanted to mention or any points that we left unsaid? Um, not that I can think of. Yeah, I think we covered a lot. I know people will really love listening to plant information because we murder plants all the time so that'll be great yeah. yeah oh um definitely one thing i would have to say is uh if you're able to when you're building your setup let it sit and mature for at least a month if possible because that's the biggest sort of like killer of your plants is not letting them establish themselves first mm -hmm. because plants themselves are very tough or else there wouldn't be stuff growing outside with the amount of animals there are. Uh, but if they're able to establish themselves, then they're going to have a much better chance of surviving than opposed yeah, that, to just throwing your crested gecko in there and it jumps on everything and knocks them out of the ground. Exactly. That is such a good point. Is like there's a, I, I know some people who are really hardcore vivarium builders will go like six, eight months and let things grow in and do a good trim before they add the animals back in. So if you have that kind of patience, which is, it's kind of nice because it's still a beautiful piece of, 
you know, something to look at. It's not like it's an ugly eyesore without the animal. The animals always complicate the vivarium. So it's nice to let it establish and get the roots set in and, and then see how it balances before, you know, confusing things. And then, you know, even if you have a, a situation like I had with pests, it's much easier to deal with before you have an animal. Oh, yeah. in there. Definitely a lot easier. Cool. Well, can you let everybody know where you can be found online? Yeah. So I can be found on any social media platform I'm on currently. It's under Mr. Vivarium. And then I just started up the account for Expedition Wildside on Instagram as well. So we're currently there with one post, but hey, yeah. that's where it starts. Awesome. Yep. Well, Nick, thank you so much. This was great. I'm really hoping some people learn some tips here and we can hopefully have some plants looking healthier and more lush in the future because of this. So I really do appreciate this. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot for having me. Yeah. All right. That is the end of that episode. Nick, thank you so much for joining me for that hour. That was a great conversation. And like I said, through the intro, definitely want to have you back on at least a couple of times so we can get more of that plant information. I know we just sort of scratched the surface here. This is a really good foundational episode for everybody. I know for myself personally, I'm definitely really motivated after talking to you for an hour to keep plants alive, keep them healthy and try to have them thriving in the enclosure. So I know the listeners probably feel the same way. If you did enjoy today's episode of the podcast, really the best thing you can do is share it, share it on any social media platform. Or if you are listening to us on the Apple podcasting app, a five star rating does really go a long way to help our visibility in the app. Thank you very much to CustomReptileHabitats.com for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. If you're looking for more information on them, you can find the link in the YouTube description or the show notes, which are found at AnimalsAtHomeNetwork.com. And if you are looking to be part of the Animals at Home community, make sure you come check us out at Patreon. There is a link in the description below, or just go to Patreon.com and search Animals at Home and the page will pop up. All right, that wraps up the entire episode. Have a great week and I will talk to everyone next Sunday.